Mrs. B. It is 1 p.m. Friday, July 11th, 2008. I am Steve Brown with the Cantini First Division Oral History Project, and I'm here today with Mr. Uh, Clark Fuller of Columbus, Ohio. And we're here to talk about his military experience and particularly his experience in uh, the Big Red One Division. Mr. Fuller, how do you spell your last name? Fuller is F-U-L-L-E-R. Okay. And you want to tell us a little bit about your family background before you got into the military? Okay, sure. Uh, actually, I was born here in Columbus, Ohio, and I was one of um, a family of six children. And uh, I became interested in the military when I went to uh, college in the 60s. And... I got interested in the military because I got drafted <laughs> and became involved in uh, ROTC. And so where did you go to college? Eastern Kentucky University. And that was on a track scholarship, right? It was on an athletic scholarship, exactly. And at the time, while you're in college, you could get a deferment from the draft. But uh, because of limitations on finances, I dropped out for uh, about six months, and that's when I got picked up on the draft. And uh, I went back to school after that and was able to obligate myself to ROTC, so they deferred the draft under the understanding that I would uh, finish the ROTC. And finishing ROTC then um, got me in the military, and that started my career and lasted uh, for 22 and a half years. How did your family respond, Mom, Dad, when you said, hey, I'm, I'm going this military route? Well, you know, the military to them was kind of uh, new to the family. Uh, my dad was never in the military, and neither was my grandfather. My dad was not in because he had broke his neck uh, and had uh, a neck injury that disqualified him from the draft. And at the time, I was the second oldest, and uh, one of my other brothers was interested in the military, but uh, he waited until after I had already gone into ROTC before he went into the Air Force. And each one of my other two brothers actually went in, too. So there was four boys out of the six children, and all four of us had military experience. I was the only one who stayed in for 22 and a half years. Um, I had another brother, though, who retired out of the Air Force. He retired at 20 years. And actually, he and I were in Vietnam together. What was he doing in Vietnam? He was there as a technician for intelligence work on fixed-wing aircraft. They would take photograph of uh, areas designated of suspected, uh, you know, um, enemy activity, and then they'd bring that back, and then the intelligence folks would analyze it and things such as that. So they had a pretty good, rewarding uh, position there with the Air Force as well. Okay. So you went through ROTC and you got military training. Then you graduate from college. What's the next step? Well, the next step was to go to active duty, and I had about two weeks break between graduation and when I went on active duty. And my first assignment was a basic course training in engineering. And I went through ranger training also, which was a two, um, about two and a half month worth of um, jungle warfare and mountain warfare training in Georgia and Florida. And following that, I was assigned to an engineer unit in Fort Lewis, Washington. Spent about six months there, and then the next stop was Vietnam. Um, you went through jump school? I went through jump school after returning from Vietnam. Okay. The window was so short, they didn't want to invest too much money in training and time in order that I'd missed my uh, opportunity to serve overseas. So uh, I received actually airborne training after I returned from Vietnam. Okay. What kind of engineering training did you receive? Combat engineering. Uh, I had some civil engineering uh, educational background. Initially when I went to college, it was actually in their pre-engineering program, uh, mostly in the uh, mathematics area. But the reason I dropped out of the pre-engineering and took up uh, earth science and geology and geography was that you had to have transferred over to another university. And it would have been a lot more expensive in order to do that. But I still wanted to be an engineer at heart. And so the closest thing in the military that would use those type of skills would be the Corps of Engineers. And so I was um, 
fortunate enough to get into the Corps of Engineers as a branch assignment, and it's worked out really well, actually. And what did they do with you initially when you got in in terms of training? Uh, they engineering have training. Engineering training, what they do for all newly commissioned officers who uh, have uh, the engineer branch designation is that you have to go through an officer basic course. And the officer basic course generally at that time was somewhere between 9 to um, 12 weeks. I was in an accelerated course. Um, my course actually only lasted six weeks. There was about 20 of us who was in the accelerated course. And we got selected for that because we were on the um, regular Army list. And those regular Army um, listed persons, they needed them overseas rather quickly. And so they shortened the time of the formal education in the engineer basic course. What sorts of things did you learn about there? Well, um, primarily construction of roads, uh, airfields, uh, pipeline systems, those things that are common to an engineer construction mission. But since I had a um, combat engineer designation, most of the type of training was in explosives, bridge building, uh, breaching minefields, things that had to do with um, offensive and defensive operations in support of infantry combat operations. So when did you arrive in Vietnam? Arrived in Vietnam in February of um, 1969. And actually I landed there on the anniversary date of when I went on to active duty. So exactly one year after I went on active duty, I was in Vietnam. What were you thinking as the plane came down? Well, one of the things was um, where was I going to be assigned? Because, you know, at the time, uh, all um, uh, persons who were going to Vietnam were individual replacements. They didn't go as a uh, part of a unit. And as an individual replacement, it was going to take a couple of days for the uh, replacement organization to slot you into position. And so I spent uh, about three days at Benoit Air Base uh, and there was going to be determined whether it was going to be shipped up north to I Corps, whether you're going to stay in Three Corps area, which was north of Saigon, or go down into the Delta, or maybe be in Pleiku in the Four Corps area, or wherever. And that was probably a time of anticipation because, you know, you're kind of in limbo and you're seeing where other people who are, got there maybe a day ahead of you are being sent up to the DMZ. There would, um, maybe the 101st, and you got others who are going to the 4th Infantry Division, which is in the mountains. And I finally got my assignment, which was the 1st Infantry Division, which I didn't really know that much about. But uh, I found out very quickly that uh, there was a lot of legacy with the 1st Infantry Division. How did you find that out? Well, there was a big sign in the 1st Infantry Division area. When I flew into their area from the replacement depot, first thing that you saw was the division motto was uh, no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. In big letters, can't miss it. And then your first thing that goes through your mind is, oh, shoot, I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. No mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great. So I don't know. That, you know, that kind of was a, not a shocker, but it was a, a, a major wake up. Can I ask you what your first impression of Vietnam was when you got off the plane? Well, it was dusty dirty and a lot of a lot of guns everywhere and relatively what I expected in a way but uh, it was hot uh, when I got there I think it was still part of the dry season uh, it was a year anniversary from Tet uh, folks seemed to be on edge uh, so it was kind of a thing to where, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here and you got to get into the mode. Uh, one thing that was very apparent, though, that the persons you talked to, they knew exactly how many days they had left. Hmm. And everybody had their short timer calendar is what they called it. And so they definitely knew that they had a period of time to do their mission, uh, keep from getting killed, and get back home. You arrive at Lycay. What's the first project that you went to work on? My first assignment was a crappy assignment. I was placed in something called the Base Development Officer uh, Office, which was uh, sort of like a facilities development 
um, office that kind of kept track of the progress of construction around the base camp, meaning um, new facilities that were being constructed to support the troops, um, types of um, uh, construction on roadways within the base camp. And the, the base camp, which was division headquarters, was, was kind of huge because it had an airfield uh, for helicopters. Uh, it had a lot of logistics areas, uh, fuel depots, and that sort of thing. So the mission of that office was not um, uh, menial or trivial. I mean, it had an important office, but it was not, you know, something that you'd want to say that this is what I did in Vietnam. You know, I was over there and I was doing what everybody else does here in the States at a station, so it wasn't very glamorous. And so I was there for a month, and after that I got assigned to a line company, and a line company was one that was um, out in the boonies or in the bush someplace. And then you had real combat support missions to infantry units and things such as that. And I spent then about four months with a line company doing some really good type of support missions. We, uh, we supported a land clearing unit which opened the roads from uh, the northern sector of the core that we were in over to the Cambodian border. And see, so we were in the field quite a bit and you were intermingling with the other units which were the artillery, artillery units the uh, mechanized units. In our case, it was uh, uh, the 11th uh, Armored Cavalry Regiment and several others. But it gave a real taste of being involved in combat missions. And I was involved in uh, a line company mission for that for four months. And because I was associated with the land clearing units, my next assignment was with the land clearing element. It was a platoon that the first engineers, which is part of the division, the engineer component of the division, had developed itself. It had uh, four M60 tanks. It had uh, six specially prepared land clearing uh, dozers. And it had a maintenance element attached to it. A platoon of about uh, 50 individuals, uh, made up of all volunteers because the mission was such to where they would go with some mechanized units or some infantry units to targeted areas where suspected uh, Viet Cong were hiding or infiltrated. And we'd clear the area in order for the armored personnel carriers to go into the area and do search and destroy missions and things such as that. It was a dangerous mission, but it was made up of volunteers. It was a core of, of engineers that I have a lot of regard and a lot of respect for. We took casualties, um, but I think that the level of respect that that unit got was above a lot of the other units that were not direct combat units, such as your infantry and your mechanized units. I think it's probably one of the elite engineer positions you could have. That and the tunnel rats, I think. So did you come under direct fire? Yes. Mainly because, you know, when we were going into an area of suspected enemy activity, the first element that would go through would be the lead bulldozer. And this bulldozer had a protective cab on it. It was ring, uh, had a ring of um, flak vest around the cab, which was made up of steel mesh. And he would blindly plow, well not blindly, he would, he would have an azimuth in which to go through the jungle and then the armored personnel carriers and the infantry would come behind him. And the six dozers would go in an echelon and then our six tanks, which would uh, follow. But they would be ambushed. Um, the largest hazard was probably running into booby traps, which were in the trees. Uh, a lot of times there would be artillery rounds that had been rigged into the trees. Uh, either 105 rounds or 155 rounds, they would go off. And even though the operators would have on their helmet, they would have their protective mm. equipment, they'd be, you know, surrounded with their flight jackets, they would still take casualties. Um, we had uh, one of our operators right before I took over, which was in the summer of 69, had been killed. And I took over the platoon two weeks after that. And, you know, morale was kind of not good, but we had a very um, oh, tough first mission on 
right after that when they went back to the field. And we took three other casualties where these artillery rounds had exploded and we lost uh, three operators uh, who were evacuated out and they never were able to return to duty. Did any of them, were they just severely wounded or did they die or? Severely wounded while uh, my uh, watch was there. Okay. But believe it or not, we had other volunteers who came into the platoon that wanted to get into the platoon that took their place. And so we didn't have too much of a problem on getting volunteers to come into the unit, even though the, the duty was pretty hazardous. This is hazardous duty. You're going forward, leading the way into uh, presumably entrenched areas. Why would you do it? What was the motivation? Well, like what I said before, it's one of those things that is highly recognized within the unit as being an elite core of soldiers who's doing something really exemplary. And there are those, even though it was during the period of the draft, even though there are soldiers who didn't want to be in Vietnam in the first place, there were those who really took the extra risk and enjoyed doing that type of work. My major concern a lot of time was to be able to temper the amount of zealousness or aggressiveness that this platoon had. Uh, you know, they would find things that were booby trapped, they'd want to take away the, they want to go in and disassemble the booby traps themselves. Um, they would want to, you know, do things that maybe in some ways could have been handled in other methods that would not cause risk or harm to an individual. Um, so you can only control that to a degree. And, you know, I mean, you go into a place and you'd probably want to bring in artillery rounds and just blow the place to smithereens first. But if you did do that, you'd destroy some intelligence. A lot of times you may destroy caches of, of ammunition or something else that may have been planted in these areas. So sometimes it did take individual searches in order to um, find some uh, material and intelligence that would be of use to the military. Uh, but sometimes it was kind of kind of hold kind of difficult to hold hold persons back. So these were, for lack of a better word, these guys were fire eaters. Yeah, they were very aggressive. Exactly. Any of them in particular that you remember? Any particular incidents that you remember about them? Oh, yeah. There was a um, gentleman who always wanted to be the lead, lead bulldozer. And what was his name? Um, Daniel C. Clark. And believe it or not, he was from Indiana. They called him Popcorn. They called him Popcorn because uh, his girlfriend would always send him presents in a box, and the packing was always popcorn. And she'd send you know, things that you probably couldn't get in either the post exchange or something else. But they called him Popcorn. I called him Big Red because he was a big, tall guy. I guess he's probably about maybe 6'4", uh, full head of red hair. And as a matter of fact, I bought a picture of him. I'll show it to okay. you afterwards. And, uh, you can show it to us now if you'd like. Yeah, I... You know, it's kind of funny when... The war was over, or when, you know, you rotated, you lost contact with a lot of people. And some of the folks that I had made contact, here's Big Red. He's the, that's his bulldozer. And his bulldozer, each one of the plow operators had a nickname for it. His was called Iron Butterfly. I think you probably like that group. I think Iron Butterfly was a group that was popular during the Vietnam days. And there were other fellows, too. This gentleman here who was a plow operator, I believe he was from Arkansas, he called his uh, bulldozer Bloody Yank. And asked me, well, why do you call it Bloody Yank? Because I think when he went on rest and recuperation in Australia, he had talked with some Australian girl there. He was a single guy. And the girl that he took out for dates during that time called him a Bloody Yank. So they came back and called his bulldozer that. 
We had six operators. They would rotate in and out, but those guys are hardcore, very respected by me, bunch of bunch of guys. How many in you, 50 altogether? The platoon, platoon was made up of about 50 folks. Exactly. Yeah. You've got another large picture there. What is that? Yes, this is um, one of the hazards of um, the crew was, you know, you'd be going through triple canopy jungle and you couldn't see what was in front of you. A lot of times I would do some reconnaissance in a light observation helicopter to make sure that, you know, we were getting the cut right. But these guys couldn't see the bomb craters in front of them. They'd fall into B-52 craters all the time. And so this is one where he was down in a crater, and I think we had to get our tanks to come up and haul him out of there with uh, cables and that sort of thing. It appears that they're wearing rain gear. Yes, this was during the monsoon, during the late summer. And during the monsoon, we wind up having a lot more difficult time because, uh, you know, a lot of times you'd be in some swampy areas, and if you have a mechanized unit just with you, they're limited on where they can go um, without getting bogged down. But most oftentimes you kind of winch yourself out and use other equipment to pull yourself out of operations like that too. But if you fall into a bomb crater that's filled with water, you're going to be in there for a while. Hmm. Um, I have another picture while we're talking yeah. about pictures. This is one of those, um, one I had mentioned I was with a... Uh, platoon. This is a land clearing, not a land clearing, but a mine sweep operation. And most oftentimes the engineers would be the first ones out in order to open the roads in the morning. And the Viet Cong were always very crafty about knowing that you're going to be in this road. So they'll plant types of demolitions. And it's not uncommon in a lot of cases if you don't do these sweeps to have the tracks blown off of your uh, bulldozers, your tanks, your army personnel carriers, and things such as that, too. Now, these uh, bulldozers, and, well, let me go back. to You, you mentioned that road clearing uh, unit. Did you also work with roam plows? Well, the land clearing outfit that I was just talking about, those are the roam plows. Okay. Those are the roam plow platoon that the engineers had specifically for the division. But there were land clearing companies in Vietnam that, depending on what corps they were in, were utilized around um, Vietnam in order primarily to clear the main supply routes. They would clear the jungle away from those main supply routes so that the convoys would be less susceptible to being ambushed. And in the three core area, um, that area for us stretched, stretched from Saigon all the way up through uh, Highway 1 and QL 13 to areas that were in the northern part of the core sector. And they were pretty effective at doing that um, because you could travel those roads and, you know, you'd have the jungle cleared back for quite a long ways. Uh, up in the other cores, though, that were in the mountains, like in 4 Corps um, uh, with the 4th Infantry Division, that'd be a lot more difficult to achieve that at least 200 meters off each road on either side. And that this clearing on both sides of the road, that was accomplished with the Rome plows? No, that type of mission was primarily with the land clearing companies. Okay. Our Rome plows, like I had mentioned before, was primarily attached to mechanized units who were doing okay. search and destroy missions. So ours was more in pinpointed sectors. Uh, for instance, we had... Um, um, a place called the Iron Triangle. That was an area that was always being infiltrated by a specific uh, Viet Cong, uh, North Vietnamese Army mix of, of, um, of troops. And we were always searching in that area, but it was a lot of time hide and go seek. But in order to find out where they're at, you know, you would get your intelligence to where they would think that they know that that's where they're at. They would organize, first of all, maybe a B-52 strike, soften them up, and then next they'd bring in your other units, your infantry and mechanized units, and a lot of times supported with our bulldozer platoon. And they would go in, um, a lot of times have to march from long distance. They could go as far as they could by trucks, but in order to keep the 
the equipment from overheating. We'd get as close as we could, but the rest of it would be by road. And then you'd stay out there for uh, all your operation would last maybe two, three weeks before you come back in. What um, what kind of bulldozers were you using? In They're, the, the size is, is a D8 bulldozer. Um, caterpillar. Conventionally caterpillar type of bulldozer uh, with a special blade. The special blade uh, had the ability to penetrate the large trees and split them. And it also had a cutting blade that would be able to cut the tree so that it could be knocked down. These blades were built not for moving earth, but for penetrating large trees and that sort of thing. And that was the? The Rome plow. That was the Rome plow. That was the Rome plow, which uh, is manufactured and was manufactured in Rome, Georgia at the time and brought to Vietnam. A pretty unique piece of equipment. Did you also, uh, in addition to land clearing, did you do any uh, destruction or clearing of bunkers, things like that? Yes. We had uh, with us a, um, a uh, vehicle called a uh, combat engineer vehicle, a CEV. And I don't have a photo of it, but it had a short tube. It looked like a tank, but instead of um, the, um, the uh, tank gun, it had a, uh, uh, what they called a, uh, a HEP round that it would fire a high explosive projectile that was meant not to penetrate armor or to um, you know kill troops or anything like that but it was a, a bus it was a bunk or a bunker buster and we had that as a part of our arsenal with the uh, Rome plow platoon and when we'd come into those we would use that to blow up bunkers in addition to using conventional uh, type of uh, explosives laid by, by engineers. You mentioned you, you had nicknames for your guys and they had nicknames for their equipment. What was your nickname? Well, the troops never called me that. <laughs> but uh, um, either I was called Lieutenant Fuller or, uh, you know, the other officers, you know, they would call me uh, Mad Dog call me Moss, that sort of thing. Why would they call you Moss? Um, it comes from when I was actually small, and my dad called me um, Peanut. And it got misconstrued along the way to Peamups, to Pete Moss, and then to Moss. Okay. And so the Moss kind of stick stuck, and so I'm still kind of the Moss now, too. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you now and listening to you talk to me, and I'm trying to figure out where Mad Dog came from. <laughs> yeah, well, that was in high school. Okay. A couple of my buddies, we'd run around, and we had nicknames for each other, okay. and mine was Mad Dog. Okay. okay. <laughs> that kind of stuck, too. Because I'm not seeing a Mad Dog here. So. <laughs> um, you, uh, during the time period, you guys are... Tell me about tunnel rats. Could you tell me about tunnel rats? You sure. mentioned them before. Tunnel rats was a, another unique platoon that was in the engineer battalion. Uh, you know, tunnels in Vietnam were very common. Uh, you may have heard of Coochie tunnels out of the 25th Infantry Division operating area. They were huge. Um, I never got a chance to see or participate in those operations while I was in Vietnam because it was in another divisional sector. But I did go back to Vietnam in 1990, right after I retired, and I had the opportunity to go to the Coochie Tunnels. And they're just north of Saigon, and I was totally impressed to, at the network itself and how ingenious the Viet uh, Cong were. Because, you know, they had uh, these things under the ground that were almost undetectable. I mean, you could be walking along, and you'd wind up falling into one without even knowing it. They had hospitals, they had uh, cooking units, they stored all their munitions, their food, and a lot of other things, all in these tunnels. And you could be operating along uh, the top, and you wouldn't even know that they were there. Uh, so the first engineers in the 1st Infantry Division area had a special platoon that was to search out 
tunnels. And whenever any tunnels were uncovered in a divisional area, they'd fly in through helicopters, these units of tunnel rats, who would go down with their 45, uh, with whatever other sidearm they had to explore these tunnels to find out what was there. Um, I would not have wanted to be a part of that element because it's one of the reasons I didn't go into the tank corps is because I'm a little claustrophobic to go into underground like that and to be that confined and then to wind up shooting at people uh, when you were in there is gee, just a very hazardous mission. But I did know the lieutenant who was in charge of that platoon. Actually, I'd, he and I had met each other before we even did, went to Vietnam. And then we wound up uh, being in Vietnam, and he wound up controlling that unit, and I wind up controlling another. The one real good thing about being a tunnel rat, you found all kinds of neat souvenirs. <laughs> I mean, you could find NVA flags. You could find um, North Vietnamese um, uh, weaponry that you'd have first pick at. And so you'd bring those things out, and of course you'd have to get licensed uh, in order to export those type of things. But they found all kinds of neat things. But that unit was very well respected as well. And they had a very tough mission. Did you lose any of your men in that platoon? As I said before, the Wounded. one person who had got killed during my watch was killed two weeks before I took over. And then the other three were wounded through booby traps and that sort of thing, evacuated to Japan in, in most cases, never to return to Vietnam. Um, and I've always kind of wondered, you know, uh, what happened to those three. And I just haven't been able to make the connection to see whether or not those troops are still alive, whether they died after they were evacuated or... or Do you remember their names? One, McDermott. Uh, the other two I'd have to go back and take a look at. Um, there were a lot of close calls after that, uh, you know, where troops would, you know, sometimes we'd be our own worst enemy um, because of accidents, uh, uh, maybe and sometimes carelessness. Um, we'd start very early in the morning. Uh, I mean, it's sunup. Uh, you know, the infantry and the mechanized units would be going out the gate or going out of this night defensive position that we made, and we had to be ready to go with them. But in a lot of cases, uh, you know, some of the, the, the ambushes that had been set up, the mechanical ambushes, may not have been taken down. I'm talking about claymores that were set up with trip wires to catch anybody that was coming through uh, the trail or things such as that. Your events. own. Not ours, but the units that we were with. Their claymores. Their claymores. And, you know, you'd be crashed through the jungle and you'd run into these things. And they'd go off. And fortunate enough, the way that the claymores were set, they were not aimed to fire high. They were aimed to fire parallel with the ground. Well, the dozer operators were high enough to where the claymores would go off and they would go and hit the side of the dozer. Um, or if you uh, come into some that were set by the NVA, theirs would be up in the trees because what they would be doing, they knew that we were in the area. They wanted to get the operator. There were a lot of close calls to where, you know, you'd see after the explosions, a lot of holes and things like that in the dozers. And we had equipment knocked out by um, the tunnels we were talking about where you'd have spider holes, those holes that were hiding um, the Viet Cong, where they would come up out of those and fire not at the front of the dozer, but they'd fire sideways. And they'd either fire at the cab or they'd fire at the engine. And we had several of those that were knocked out because of that. What did they fire with? Uh, it was the rocket-propelled grenades primarily because those are the only things that would be effective. Of course, if they fired with a rifle, they were going to be wasted because following the dozers, you had a lot of firepower. And once an incident happened, well, the dozer would stop, and we'd have our, I'd have the uh, armored personnel carrier behind the lead dozer, and he and I were in communication all the time, and whenever anything like that would happen, 
Well, of course, we would see it, and he would know then that he would have to get out of harm's way because there's going to be return fire that's coming in his direction. So most oftentimes, he would just get off his dozer and come back. I mean, he would have his own weapon, but the instructions were that he was to get out of the area so that the return fire could come without us knowing really what was in front. Okay. You lost a cousin of a coochie, is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, Butch, that was his nickname, Butch Fuller. Were you too close before Vietnam? Yes. Actually, um, he was... Um, he was a nephew of uh, my dad, so meaning that he was the son of my uh, father's brother. And there was two boys that my uncle had who was the same age as me and my oldest brother. And so we were very close all the way through childhood. As a matter of fact, my di dad died just this year, and I had found a letter that I had sent to him when I was in Vietnam and got the news that uh, Butch had been killed. Butch was an engineer also, and Butch was doing a uh, bridge explosive type of um, maneuver. They're demolishing a bridge, and the explosives went off prematurely, and he got killed uh, as a part of that, he and uh, the teammate that he was working with. And it was kind of tough. Um, I think that my family was a lot more concerned then about what was going to happen with me, but I didn't want them to worry or anything about that. Uh, but, yeah, that was, that was a close family tragedy, I think. How did that affect you, doing your job? Well, you know, I felt bad, but, you know, you had to do what you had to do. And, of course, you know, you always get the letters then that say, well, you know, be careful with all you do. You'd be careful regardless, but, you know. I mean, you, those things happened, and then those the, there are those that are around you that you get to know that you kind of look out for each other. You know, um, and I'm sure that in today's war in the Middle East, the camaraderie that the, you develop among those that you're working with is very strong. And so you wind up not being so much attentive to world events as you do as a military family. You know, you're kind of oblivious to what else is going around. Yes, you got your mission and everything, but you're looking out and caring about those who are around you. And so, in a way, even though Butch was my cousin, I felt bad about it. The impact, I think, was a lot larger when you lost persons who were not blood-related within your own unit. But you handled it as best you could. Um, I had a question. Um, in in dealing with that, you you've mentioned losing people around you to some degree, um, not within your own platoon. You would have seen evidence of combat. How did that affect you? You ever see a, a dead body? Oh, yes. Matter of fact, I was going to bring some with me, but I. Decided not to because, you know, some of those things you just kind of like to forget. Um, one thing you never did, or we never did, you never really took photos of uh, friendly dead. And, but you saw it, but you never wanted to record it or anything such as that. Uh, you saw a lot of enemy dead. Uh, I didn't have no problem taking some photos of that one whenever, you know, it was convenient and didn't interfere with the mission or anything like that. But as a part of the psychology of dealing with the enemy, the Viet Cong, and in dealing with those who were working with the Viet Cong as pacifists, whenever you had enemy dead, you left them out for the villagers to see. You left them out because that had an impact. It had an impact on them in that for them to be sympathetic or sympathizer to the Viet Cong was not going to turn out good. So you would see bodies that the U.S. would leave out and the Army of the Republic of Vietnam to have a psychological impact. So you saw bodies all the time. How did it affect you the first time you saw it? 
Well, you don't get used to it. Uh, it's something that, you know, gee, you know, that could be anybody. I mean, that's still a person. Uh, you know, they have their cause that they're fighting for. You've got your cause that you're fighting for. So, yeah, you know, it's one of those things, you know, it's too bad that somebody has to die. Uh, and you say, well, gee, it's, it's a waste, but, you know, it could be you. Um, there's, you asked me one thing, too, that's, that's memorable about seeing uh, dead bodies. One, one that that's still sticks in my mind, which probably, uh, oh, I don't know, hurts the most, is that we were in a position of where we were um, we had a night defensive position where we were opening this road. Remember I told you that I was with a platoon. It was with this land clearing company up to the Cambodian border. And at night, what you do is you build a uh, dirt berm, and you set up your um, armored personnel carrier in a position to where you can see the enemy coming, and you got firing positions and stuff at night. And if there's anything that's moving out there, you um, you know you can fire in that direction because you know there's not supposed to be anything out there. Well, where I had my platoon set with the mechanized units around the, the perimeter with their um, armored personnel carriers set up. In the middle of the dark, we thought that we were under attack. And the armored personnel carrier, which was closest to us, blew up in flames and killed everybody that was on board. So what we did then, we organized a uh, search team out of um, the engineers that we had with the platoon engineers. And we got all of our equipment, all of our weaponry and so forth like that. And we had the mortar rounds light up the area. And what we did was we went out to see if there were enemy dead there or whether or not there was any body parts that may have came from the uh, armored personnel carrier. Uh, we went out, we searched the area probably uh, a couple of hundred yards you know, out and then maybe a hundred yards to either side. But we didn't locate anything. And the next day during daylight, what had really happened was that one of the grenades within the armored personnel carrier had become detached from where it was stored along the side and had blew up the ammunition that was in um, the armored personnel carrier, including some M72 laws the other grenades that they had and a whole bunch of other stuff. And the thing blew up and burned and, you know, obliterated things. What we did then, though, is that, you know, a lot of cases when you have a combat loss like that, you take the machine gun and the um, 50 caliber and everything else off that you can retrieve. You dig a hole and you bury it. Well, at that time, and uh, I kind of thought, thinking back on this, probably should have did this, you know, there was a box of letters that was in this armored personnel carrier that had got scattered all over the place. Well, we buried those letters with this armored uh, personnel carrier. And I think back on it, and I thought that those were probably the last letters that those troops had wrote. I didn't think about this until probably about maybe a month later. And we buried those letters in that ammunition can. They had an ammunition can with the armored personnel carrier. And I think about it, and I would think that maybe those relatives and families would have wanted those, but we didn't think about it. So when you talk about seeing dead bodies, how did it affect me? Well, seeing those dead troops and knowing that there's that one little last thing that I probably could have done, I probably should have. But the other bad thing about it, too, is that it wind up being an accident. They killed them. And I'm not sure whether or not it would have been reported that way. Uh, I noted in a lot of instances, even though something may have been caused because of uh, careless, carelessness that may or may not have been direct enemy related, it probably was not reported that way. It was probably reported killed in action as a result of enemy activity. You know, if there's any question, that's the way it wound up getting reported. Because who wants to get a letter saying that your son or even your, your daughter in some case, um, got blowed up because, you know, 
there was a little accident that, you know, killed everybody. The whole controversy that we've had with Pat Tillman's death. Right, exactly. I'm not surprised about that. Um, let me change the focus just a little bit. You are obviously an African American. You've got at least one man underneath you, Big Red, was from Arkansas. Um, well, Big Red was from Indiana. Oh. There was the other one that was from Arkansas, uh, Bloody Yank. Bloody Yank yeah. was from Arkansas. Uh, you probably had some other Southerners. Uh, what were race relations like between you and these men to whom you have to give orders? Okay. You know, um, like I said, in the drone plow unit, it was all volunteer. And those guys had a high sense of morale. The esprit de corps was there. Uh, there was no real race relation problem within that unit. If anything, there was probably more, you know, the marijuana, uh, that sort of thing, because, you know, when you're in that way, there's, there's some escape that you have to have. And I knew that it was there because some of the some of the soldiers in the mornings, you know, you, you could tell that they, you know, they were impacted by that because, you know, they'd have a hard day out and they came back in. Uh, and I knew that it occurred. I would not deliberately go searching for it and busting people. Uh, outside of that unit, though, in the general population, as a regular platoon, were there race tension? And my answer is yes. The reason there was race tension is because a lot of the troops didn't want to be in Vietnam. I mean, a lot of troops during that time didn't want to be in the Army. Uh, so not only just in Vietnam, but in the Army in general, there were race problems. When I first went into the Army, I had this idea that, okay, here it is, you know, the military is the military, you know, everybody gets a fair shake, um, everything's on even keel. Well, it wasn't. Uh, I was a little naive. Um, I found out later by talking to other uh, black officers, and a lot of cases when you'd be in a unit, you'd count the black officers on your hand. You became pretty well close-knit because, you know, you had a common uh, environment that you were operating in. Um, a lot of the officers at that time may have come out of ROTC units from historically black colleges. Um, and there is a strong connection between those colleges in terms of not only academics, but in terms of, you know, experiences and military career and things such as that. Uh, I happened to come out of an ROTC unit that was not from an HBCU, so I had an experience of growing up with a majority um, black, I mean, a majority white corps cadets and was able to work within that environment. Uh, there were the good old boys in the leadership positions within the Army when I came in as a lieutenant. And in comparing some of the efficiency reports that some of the black officers got, and we compared notes, they were not getting a fair shake. And I think at the time, during the late 60s and the early 70s, uh, it was unfortunate. And the reason I say it was unfortunate was because when Vietnam was going down, we were withdrawing from Vietnam, we had more soldiers in the military than we needed. And we had more officers in the military than we needed. So there was a reduction in force. We call it the RIF. Everybody across the board then were looked at very critically. Your efficiency reports were very clearly a part of the equation as to whether or not you were a quality officer that you were going to be retained on service, whether or not you had a degree, um, and several other factors, recommendations from your commander and a whole bunch of other things. Well, if you had bad efficiency reports, that was going to weigh heavy on whether you got kicked out or not. And I think, even though it may not be admitted, I do think that a high number of uh, African-American officers at the time got a raw deal because of some of the good old boy network when they were lieutenants and didn't get a fair, fair shake when they were uh, on board. 
I'll say one other thing here too, and, and, and it's an incident that kind of shaped me a little bit when I was in the uh, period of learning the ropes as a, as, as a second lieutenant. I told you I went through ranger training. Ranger training is a very tough um, challenge. We had a platoon, we had four platoons of um, rangers, and these are all officers. They range from second lieutenant all the way up to captain. And we were in Georgia, and we were getting ready to move from the Camp Benning phase, or Fort Benning stage, to um, Dahlonega, Georgia, where the mountain phase is going to start. And we were in formation one morning, all four platoons. The first platoon to our to my left was comprised of airborne qualified rangers, potential rangers, and also Navy SEALs. You never get any news while you're there. I mean, you're just totally blanked out when you're going through the training. I mean, you're, you're locked in and you're theirs. Well, they did give us an update on the news, and they mentioned about Martin Luther King having been assassinated. And I'm still thinking back on this at this day, and I hope it was because of the way that, you know, the tough guy image that Rangers are supposed to be. I'm hoping that because of that tough guy image that was pounded into all of us, that the cheer that went up in that platoon that had those airborne and had the SEALs was only because of that tough guy image, and it was not because Martin Luther King got assassinated. But just that one platoon, no, no other reaction from anybody else. And that made me start thinking in the back of my head at the time, says, well, when I get out of this training and I'm a lieutenant for real, so yeah, I'm going to have to be looking out for what that might mean otherwise. And during the period of the early 70s, when I came back to Vietnam, the Army went through a transformation. They ended the draft, and there was an all-volunteer Army. There were a lot of programs that were put into place that was to be for equal opportunity, equal opportunity awareness, uh, understanding of culture, a review uh, mechanism in which to catch unfair non-judicial punishment that was dealt out to minorities that may be perceived as being unfair, uh, and counseling sessions, um, having avenues to where incidents can be reported that would not have retribution, um, appointment of uh, EO officers in units, having RAP sessions with, with the troops. I happened to have an engineer company back in Fort Lewis, Washington in the early 70s where there was myself as the company commander. This is after you're back from Vietnam? After back from Vietnam. What rank would you be at this time? If you're a leading? captain. Okay. And as a preface, let me, let me lead into this this way. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam, um, I was under a volunteer indefinite status. Viet the Vietnam experience for me, it was a very fulfilling assignment because I thought it was very meaningful. I was doing something that I could see results from in terms of our daily work routine. The time went relatively fast because you you know you were you were doing things 24 hours in a lot of cases and you knew that you had a time when you were going to leave and you aimed just towards that and, and that's the way it was well when I came back and got an assignment with a unit at Fort Lewis Washington I was an assistant uh, operations officer in the unit and the job I had was so terrible I mean it was I saw no sense in it. You know, you was an assistant to somebody, you were shuffling paper, you were doing inspections, you were designing and developing projects in terms of construction things that engineers were doing, but it was not fulfilling at all. And it was very difficult to make that transition in terms of, gee, is this the way that the rest of the Army career is going to be like? 
And it was tough to mentally get back on board for that. And I understood then why soldiers who had already been to Vietnam and who had came back would always say, I'm going to get out of this chicken butt outfit. Of course, they got a, another word other than butt, but I'm going to get out of this chicken butt outfit by 1049. I was thinking, what's a 1049? Then I heard a, somebody say a 2098. I'm going to 2098. It had nothing to do with the unit. It had something to do with the letdown of what your new mission is when you're stateside compared to what you had already been doing. And what you were doing didn't seem as important or didn't seem as critical or didn't seem as intense, didn't seem as, as challenging. But you were doing real work that was contributing to the Army's mission. But going back to the 1049, the 1049 is a form that you fill out to go back to Vietnam. It meant that your only escape out of this unit, you're going to be there two or three years. The only way to get out of here is to volunteer to go back to Vietnam. And you'd been back six months, I believe. I think you could do that. Well, some guys would say a 2098. Well, a 2098 was two 1049s. They says, I'm going to double mine. I'll fill out two of them. <laughs> and a 2098 never existed, but that's what they would say. But anyway, I went in to be a company commander. I finally got out of the assistant um, operations officer thing, and after four months went in to be a company commander. Um, me being black and my first sergeant being black, we were the only two officer, commander, first sergeant combination where we had that. And we had to deal with the same thing that all the other company commanders had to deal with. You know, um, draftees who wanted to be somewhere else. You had to do with your AWOL, you had to do with your deserters, since we were so close to the Canadian border. Hmm. Um, you know, the troops would go AWOL and they'd go to Canada. Um, in a situation where the first sergeant and I were at, we found that some of the African American soldiers wanted to transfer over to our company because they thought that they were going to have special treatment or a better deal. But you could not do that, I mean, because you had to be, even though you were sympathetic to the situation across the nation, you're in the military, and regardless of your color, you had to abide by the expectation, regardless of who you are. And so the rules had to be the same. But for some reason, there was this thought that, you know, you'd get a more of a fair shake if you were in our unit. But we had our problems, too, and some of the challenges were dealing with the African-American soldiers who wanted to see that you were sympathetic because of your color, because of you being aware of the situation, that it would somehow be better. Believe it or not, one of the biggest challenges as a company commander was dealing with the mess hall chow line that developed at noon with African-American soldiers. <laughs> it seems crazy, but it is. Not sure if you were, but there's there this thing called the DAP. And there was the braiding of shoestrings, where to identify with the black culture, you braided the shoestrings and you made these bracelets. And whenever you would great, greet another African American, there was always the exchange of brotherly get together. Well, sometimes you would, these would go on for minutes. And the worst place to have it is where you have a line of hungry troops who are trying to go through the chow line who've only got so much time to get into the mess hall, eat, and then go back to their duty station. But with our African-American soldiers, it was this as a tradition. With the guy who's in the head count who's assigned to be there and count the soldiers and check off the names and do all of that thing, um, the guys who were in the chow line dishing out the chow, you know, they would do it. But it caused the line to, you know, just not go flow the way that it was supposed to go. And so we'd have soldiers coming into the first sergeant's office, coming into my office, and we're explaining why you can't slow down the line because you're doing the dap. And this says, well, you don't understand. And you should understand, you know, and you're catching this feedback. And it's kind of difficult to come to a middle ground to make that happen. But eventually, you know, with the all-volunteer... Um, force came out, it worked its way out, but that's one thing that came out as a color barrier that I had to deal with that maybe they thought that I didn't have enough sympathy for. Let me take you back to Vietnam real quickly. Do you 
have any remembrance uh, of racial differences affecting the view of the U.S. troops towards the Vietnamese? Yes. How did that affect them? Well, I was, you know, I didn't like the way that, you know, in hindsight you can say anything, but, but you know, I, I, I didn't like the, the derogatory terms that were used against the Vietnamese Such civilian as? population in general. It was just something that the troops just picked up and they just said, well, I mean, gooks. I mean, every Vietnamese, it doesn't make a difference who they were, was a gook. And, you know, I don't think that there was a very good respect for the civilian population. I'm not talking about the Viet Cong or the enemy now, you know. I mean, you know, a lot of cases in the heat of battle where, you know, you've been hurt or maimed or something by your enemy, well, it's, you know, there's no holds barred and, you know, you don't, you're not a good guy. But in the local population itself, you know, everything was almost as if they were inferior. I mean, not only among um, the white soldiers, but among African-American soldiers too. And it was too bad, but it was probably something that we were not sensitive to, I think, where if you're going to win the hearts and minds, you've got to start with the basics. And the basics is that, you know, you're a guest in this country, even though we're there based on our ideology and what we perceive as a threat. Those folks are human as well. And if they're not directly tied or related to the enemy who you're fighting, you're never going to gain respect for them because of the way that you act, your attitude, and your misunderstanding of their culture. Uh, Mr. Fuller, after Vietnam, you had a very extensive career in the military. What sorts of things did you do? Okay, um, after Vietnam, I had like I had an assignment of um, I was at two years at Fort Lewis, Washington. Again, it was a second tour there as a company commander. I went from there to what they call the Engineer Officer Advance Course, where you get advanced training in engineering. It lasted nine months. Following that, I was fortunate enough to get nominated to go to graduate school. So I went to graduate school at Ohio University here in Ohio. That's just like throwing the old rabbit in the briar patch, you know what I mean? Throw, throw me there because I was, you know, not too far from home. So uh, I went... What did you study at Ohio University? It was uh, Earth Science and Geography okay. with a concentration in... African Studies, um, and it was for a specific follow-on to an appointment at West Point. Uh, the agreement was that I would go to graduate school for two years and give the Army another four years with at least three of those at West Point as an instructor in the Earth Sciences and Geography. And so I wound up spending three and a half years at West Point. I uh, went from West Point to an assignment in Germany two years in Germany, then an assignment with the Ohio National Guard here in Ohio again, throw me in that briar patch, here I am. Um, after that, I went to Korea for a year um, and also prior to the Ohio Army National Guard on that first tour, I was um, at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It was Command and General Staff College for a year. And then I had a three-year assignment uh, at one of the National Security Agency headquarters out of Baltimore. Uh, I was with an intelligence organization, and again, it was a foreign area officer with the focus on Africa, Africa intelligence. Uh, then came the Korea tour, and from Korea came back at the invitation of the Ohio National Guard because they had a mission in Honduras. And... They had a six-month civic action program in Honduras building roads and schools, and I was attached to that organization to complete that mission. And that led all the way up to 1990 when I retired, and that's when I went back to Vietnam on my second tour 
voluntarily. But I can go back now to what, let me ask you this, you found initially at least the Fort Lewis experience was unfulfilling for you. How about these subsequent experiences? Yes. I would say that the subsequent, subsequent experiences, uh, especially the military academy assignment, was, was very rewarding and very enlightening. Uh, at that time, I got a chance to work with, you know, officers who were, you know, essentially going through their college phase at the same time being introduced to the military. And I had a role then, a direct role, in shaping those cadets, uh, both academically and both from a military preparedness uh, point of view. And I got a lot out of that. Uh, I learned a lot also, mainly because you have a very bright element that is going through their academic career, which is very challenging, very demanding, because, you know, they're, they're doing the military thing while they're going to college, and they've got to excel in both of those. And in order to stay ahead of the game, to be sort of smarter than they are, really put the challenge and the onus on you to be very wise and very smart in your subject. As a matter of fact, you had to be, and I don't have a PhD, but you had to be the doctor in your field that you're teaching. Because they'll come at you with some things that they've seen on their own or have read on their own or knew from experience on their own that you had to be prepared to address and expound on. So that caused you to be at the top of your game. In this time frame, the military is going through a very significant transformation um, from the post-Vietnam era into the 80s. What sorts of memories do you have of that transformation? Well, one of the most remarkable transformations was, um, of course, going into the all-volunteer element of the Army, where everybody who came in was uh, wanted to be in the military and they were, weren't drafted. The other, which I thought was significant, when they allowed women to come into the military academies, which I was able to witness. Um, I was there, I think, uh, at West Point in 1976 or 1977 when they brought through the first female uh, class, uh, that, the class that had females in it. And uh, I had them, I had females in the cl uh, courses that I was teaching. And one of the most interesting things, and I'll add this as an anecdote because we were talking earlier about uh, race relations in the military. You know, at this time, the academies were an all-male bastion of, you know, a fraternal organization. And to have the female element introduced into the Corps of Cadets was not acceptable to some. You know, you... Yours is not to ask why. Yours is to do or die or do and die. So, you know, you're supposed to say yes or yes sir, three bags full and march forward. But I found that within the Corps of Cadets, when the freshman class came in that had females in it, the upperclassmen were not all that receptive. It's almost like saying, hey, you know, our tradition as to what we have carried on here for so many years has been transformed, and, and we don't like it. You know, this is there's not a tidal wave of, of resentment, but I'm saying that there was an undercurrent that was there. And the amazing thing to me was that there were some African-American cadets who were parroting the same thing. Were these upper class or freshmen? or? Uh, these are upper classmen. And I had to say to them, I says, listen, you know, you got nerve enough to say that, and you're lucky you're here yourself. And you're saying that because you're hearing it from other cadets, but you as an African-American, there are times when you would be ostracized or be silenced simply because of your color. Now, you're saying the same thing because of somebody because of their gender. And, you know, after a while, you know, well, you know, it became norm in the wave of whatever resentment was there. But you could tell that it was a part of the winds of change that those who had come before them, uh, you know, didn't want to see change. But that's, that's the way things happen. Any incidents of harassment that you remember? Of harassment of... The females? No. Okay. That would not have been tolerated. 
now you hear a lot of of stories that have happened since my days in the academy, but there was a protective barrier that was set up because the military did not want to embarrass itself or have itself embarrassed with incidents that occurred with the first classes of female cadets that came through there. And to tell you the truth, those cadets who were going there too did not want to see any incidents like that either. So it was kind of circling the wagons. They were, everybody was looking out for themselves. What sorts of things were you doing in Germany, Honduras, and Korea? Okay. Germany. I didn't like the Germany assignment. I'll say that. You know, most folks said it all love Germany. You know, the culture, the, you know, the food, the things. I love that. As a matter of fact, uh, my second wife happens to have um, uh, German ancestry. Um, but the assignment, the military assignment, was challenging in that you had to believe that during the Cold War, at any time, the Russians were going to come storming across the border and were going to invade Germany. So unlike Vietnam, you know, where you were there and things were happening and the enemy was right there, you had to psych yourself into believing that anything could happen at any minute, and you had to psych yourself on a daily basis that you had to be on guard. You had to believe that the field training that you were doing, which was periodic, was totally necessary because it's the only way that you could stay at the top of your game when they say the balloon goes up and you're ready. But it was hard to believe it, mainly because, you know, you go to the field and you'd be out there for maybe weeks, a, a week, and maybe two weeks at the most. Then you'd come back, and you're enjoying all of this comfortable uh, life around you. I mean, you had your car. Uh, you had your family. You had your house. You had to worry about cutting your grass. You'd go on vacation. You know, you'd go visit these things and stuff like that. You know, it's almost like you're kind of a tourist in there when you're not doing your real training. And you'd do this. I mean, you'd go out to the field, do your thing. The next time you're coming in, you're working in an office, and you're off work at 5 o'clock. You come back the next day, and you're out there doing all the things. You're worried about the kids going to school. You're going shopping. You're mad because they don't have your color of pants that you want. And it's almost trying to keep that level of readiness and enjoy the good life at the same time. And because of that, you know, the in and out of one realm to the next was, was kind of hard to, to kind of be, um, you know, just totally comfortable with all the time. Tough to maintain a certain level of aggression and alertness. Yes, exactly. Even though you know the threat was real, trying to make yourself believe it all the time was just kind of hard. Now, I volunteered to go to Korea for an assignment. I did that because I knew Korea would be a little bit different. Even though in Korea you do have some who are there on two-year terms who have family, the others who are there are unaccompanied. And you're up, you know, in an area where, you know, it could be very explosive. Around the DMZ. Around the DMZ. And the job assignment that I had at the time, which was with the combined field army, I was the senior U.S. engineer in a combined field staff environment. I worked side by side with a uh, Korean colonel, and he and I together did all of the engineering planning at the combined field army level for the engineers. And we had Korean military and U.S. military working for us. And we answered to a lieutenant general, uh, U.S general as well as Korean generals and we answered to a headquarters which was uh, out of Seoul but you were mixed directly and working directly with the Koreans and they had their conscripts uh, Katusas who were working right with us as well and you were immersed in that environment into the Korean military planning, the Korean culture, the Korean language. You were 
just like in Germany, you were made to take Korean um, um, language uh, courses. And you did everything together. I mean, you had quarters that, you know, um, that, you know, the Koreans shared side by side with the U.S. And again, it was one of those things where, you know, your mission and what you were doing was, was right there. And, and I think that out of my military careers, the overseas tours in that type of vir environment in hindsight, were probably the most challenging, but yet and still most satisfying and rewarding assignments of the military career, simply because you were immersed in those types of uh, environments. Uh, Honduras was was similar. In Honduras, it was only for a period of six months, and I'd spend six weeks there, and then come back to the U.S. and take go down with another rotation of uh, National Guard engineers. But again, then too, you know, you were with the Hondurans, uh, we had a military, a uh, Honduran military platoon, which was providing security for us, but you were operating in a rural environment in the mountains with the Hondurans, and you could see your results. Uh, I happened to be in charge of the civil affairs at the time, where, where we were building uh, the schools and interacting with the farmers and things such as that. Uh, had to do with bringing logistics in by helicopter into the mountains and dealing with the local populations was was um, was very rewarding. There's, there's an incident I want to bring out that just reminded me. We were dedicating a school in Honduras, and when we were completed with the school, it took us maybe, um, maybe I don't know, six weeks or something doing the rotation. And when we got finished, all the children came out and in Spanish, sang for our engineers the Honduran National Anthem. And it was so beautiful, so harmonious, and things that, you know, we were all very impressed. So then the school teacher had asked us to sing the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> Boy, we got through the, oh, say, can you see? And then, you know, it just seems as all, all the rest of us didn't know the rest of the words. We embarrassed ourselves so bad in front of these folks. I tell you, because, you know, we sang as a group, and then it started filtering off, and you could tell that, gee, the rest of these words, just some of them don't, don't know it. And I'm sure the children knew it, too. Oh, we were so embarrassed. <laughs> I tell you, now I go back, and I say that'll never happen again. Now, that would have been the time uh, the Sandinistas were active over in Nicaragua. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. Uh, did you feel like you were fulfilling a role there to help stem that tide? or Well, you know, projecting uh, American influence, whether it's um, military or whether it's political, whatever, uh, is key for us to be um, warmly received by our neighbors. And so these humanitarian actions in any country in, in, in Central America is going to do that for, for Latin America. But at the same time, Honduras was not like Nicaragua at the time, but yet still there were incidents. There were incidents where you would have uh, some convoys receive small arm, arms fire, and you were never allowed to go off the, the base camp areas without being armed. And um, that was just normal. But it was not like uh, things were in Nicaragua, which was at the neighbor to uh, uh, the south of Honduras. And I think that, you know, I, I, I've been to just about every country in, in Central America. I, I did my thesis research actually in Belize. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the United States is seen as big brother, but also, you know, we can be kind of a bully. And being a bully sometimes doesn't necessarily win friends, regardless of what else you might do on the other side. And so what was going on in Panama, what was going on in Nicaragua, and what you now see today in, in Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, some other places to where, you know, there's an anti-American feeling. Because you're powerful, you know, you just can't push people into thinking in your ideology all the time by your wealth, by your military power on several, several 
other things you might have at your disposal. And the only reason I say that from my sitting here right now is that I've, I've, I've been through a lot of countries around the world. As a matter of fact, I made it as my own little secondary thing. It was not necessarily a part of military experience, but on my own in travel is trying to understand what it is that makes the United States either an ogre or somebody that somebody idolizes and wants to, you to have you as their friend. And some, in a lot of ways, we've made some missteps. And I think those missteps needs to be corrected. And some of those is not solved by military intervention. And a lot of it's not solved by throwing money at a problem. And so we have to find ways in which to make us not be such an ugly neighbor. Did you serve in South Africa? I did not serve in South Africa, but I was temporary duty in South Africa. How long did that last? I was in South Africa on three different occasions. I was in South Africa when I was in the military. Uh, I told you I worked at the um, Intelligence and Security Command, and I worked with the defense attache in um, South Africa. And this was before um, the change of power in South Africa. And it was a good experience to be there, but at the same time I was representing the U.S. Um, government in, in the form of um, the military attaché. So I had to make sure that I was focused more on the job than being focused on the plight of the blacks in South Africa even though I had my own thoughts and feelings. But I went back to South Africa and Namibia while I was in a civilian capacity. I was able to maybe do and see things in a, in a different way. How were you treated in your TDY in South Africa? They probably wouldn't say this, but I know that the hotel that I took up residence was one that was, it was reserved as a international hotel for international visitors and international visitors were given every right as anybody else who was there but I was with another major at the time and we did go out on our own and believe it or not uh, there was some name calling um, you know and and you know the name calling they didn't even know me from Adam but you know people driving by in vehicles and that sort of thing you know derogatory type thing we kind of made me sensitive to to, to to the way things were. But I, I made it a point to take photos of, um, of some of the uh, segregation rules. All the blacks only signs, the whites only signs, they existed. This was, this was back in the early uh, uh, 80s. And it was, it was like segregated South here in the United States. And that's what the normal resident had to deal with. And then uh, I was there with there in Namibia after uh, apartheid, and things had changed somewhat. But you know it was still uh, in the in the eighties, and it was a progressive type thing. But I was able to go by road over into um, Namibia, which borders South Africa and Botswana, and see things there as well. But you know I. I'm glad to see the transformation having taken place, but there's some economic um, issues and still some social issues in South Africa that still need to be worked out. But it's a better country than when I taught uh, the geography of South Africa at West Point in the 70s. In 1990, you went back to Vietnam. Yeah. What was that like? Well, you know, I went back to Vietnam for several reasons. Um, one, you know, the experience that I had talked about before was, was, had a lot of job satisfaction to it. The other, after uh, 22 years in the military, I, be, I began to get a little confused as to what could have been training and what was real. Uh, you know, I mentioned I'd been through ranger training. I'd been through the jungle warfare school um, in Panama. And some of the incidents that, that occurred 
there and in Vietnam, you know, is either, is either part of training or was real. I, I couldn't separate them. They all kind of came together. And I can remember vividly certain things, but I said, gee, did that, was that up around Anlock? Was it down at Benlock or was that, was that at Fort Gulick? I mean, when we were out there trying to find our way down the Shaggers River or something, I, you know, it just kind of came confusing. So I said that as a reward to myself for retirement, I says, I'm going to just go ahead and go to, back to Vietnam on my own. And that's what I did. The most difficult thing was getting a visa. I had to go to Thailand first and then work with the Vietnamese embassy out of Thailand to get into Vietnam. And at the time, you know, the, the tour package that veteran groups put together was not very common. And there was still a lot of suspicion. And the suspicion was that you were coming there to do something that you ought not be doing. But I was finally able to, to get into um, Vietnam through Tonsonut Air Base. And Tonsonut was the first place that I'd ever landed when I was there. But it, I, it, it's now their international um, airport for Ho Chi Minh City. And I had to go through a bunch of formal procedures in terms of where I was going. I had to get permission to be someplace. And I had to have a government guide appointed to me, where you can't go anywhere outside the city unless you have this government-appointed person who's with you, and you've got this authorization to be where you're supposed to be. Well, I said, well, here's where I want to go. I want to go to these places because they're where our old combat operations were and things like that, and, and, and this, that, and the other. So I got all the permission things, and the last thing they said to me is, if you, you deviate from this or you do things where you're, you're supposed to be not doing, you will be punished. <laughs> that was it, you will be punished. So I said, okay. So I'm out there in the city, and you know, things at that time, this was back in 1990, you know, you still saw a horde of bicycles and motor scooters around all over the place. I was able to find somebody who spoke some English. It happened to be a gentleman who used to be in the um, uh, Army Republic of Vietnam who had gone through um, re-indoctrination training. I think he was in some kind of training camp for five years or so, but he's, he hated the communists and he still liked the Americans and he and I became pretty much good friends. I told him what I was going to do and so forth, but around Saigon, you know, he wound up being a good good friend to have who I could communicate because he'd get me in the right places and also would tell me not where to be at night and that sort of thing. Because when, when I was in, in Vietnam before, you know, I was only in Saigon as a transit either going on R&R. &R. I went down there one time to see my brother who was in the Air Force at the time. But I was not familiar with Saigon as much. I went to the old U.S. Embassy, which was closed, and went to um, the uh, National Palace and several other things you know you do around Saigon. But I did go up country in a car. I went back up to uh, Lycae. And uh, there was a small town outside of Lycae, just south of Lycae, called Vincat. And we had had some bridges blown up there, and I wanted to go back to this bridge to where it was at. I thought in order to be able to get across to folks and to get them to be friendly, I brought along some cigarettes. You know, I bought some camel cigarettes, I think, were, so I could give them to the local people. But when I was down at this bridge site where I knew that we had had uh, the bridge collapse and blown up during the war, uh, we, we attracted a crowd because of the fact that I was an American and the fact that I was giving out these cigarettes. And before long, uh, me and my escort got arrested. And Did you get punished? We got punished because we were taken to the police station. And we spent about a half a day at the police station until uh, it was getting night. And I said, oh, man, this is not going to look good. And they're going to put us in a cell and we're going to be winding up here all the time until somehow they got communications to check all of our things and so forth. And we were told to leave and not come back through Bencat. So we went on up through Lycae, and I think we spent the night in Lycae, which was where the division, division headquarters were for the 1st Division. And the next day we went up to uh, Anlock and a place called Quan Loy, which one of the brigades was up there. And, I mean... There were remnants of the war that was there. I mean, you, you know, you could tell where, you know, during the early 70s when the U.S. had left and the North Vietnamese came through there and the 
Army of the Republic of Vietnam were fighting. I mean, a lot of cemeteries around up through there now. Uh, a lot of park marked buildings are still there. The old airfield that used to be up there, you know, you can barely find it, covered with um, foliage. Um, but there are actually scavengers there trying to find metal and that sort of thing that they could sell. And I'm sure that there was a lot of ordnance that was around there that probably took its toll with people and things such as that, too. Um, what sorts of emotions did you experience? Well, it was different. Um, for one thing, you know, all the soldiers were gone. All these monuments were there. All this, the grave sites are there. The tracks that you would normally see that would be made by vehicles and that sort of thing were all overgrown. The bomb craters were overgrown. You know that they're out there someplace. Uh, and it just didn't look the way that it was. All the buildings were flattened. I mean, the Quonset huts, the tents, all that stuff. It's not there. It's almost like looking at, you know, an overgrown uh, old Mayan Indian ruin or something. You know, all the stuff that had been gone. But, it, but, but the one thing that you, that, that you never forget, you never step off the trodden trail because that's where the mines are, and I'm sure that there's still a lot of mines and so forth. That's where the booby traps. And I'm sure that just like every soldier, when, when you came back from Vietnam, for a while, you know, you don't want to walk where nobody else has walked. You just wind up getting the chance of being maybe stepping on a booby trap someplace. So while I was there, I definitely didn't do that because I know that there's still a bunch that's still out there somewhere. You mentioned before that you've had difficulty discussing Vietnam with your mother and a wife. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, it's, and I'm sure that that a lot of veterans from not only from Vietnam but any war, maybe from Korea or from any any other war, unless you're talking with other veterans that that have that share the same or similar experience that were if you say something that it automatically is understood, like you'd say RPG or you'd say uh, Claymore or you'd say uh, Riff or something like that. You know, it, it automatically is understood. Um, at the same time, too, you don't want, at least I didn't want to, I didn't want to seem braggadocio and you know, this videotape is probably the most that I've ever talked about my experience in the military or experience with Vietnam with, with almost anybody. I mean, it just, you know, it, it's, it's almost like, you know, when you're, when you're asked, there's an interest, but then it kind of, in a way, there isn't. It, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, I, I feel like, well, I need to ask you this because, you know, you were there and you kind of to be knows. polite. Yeah, so, so, so tell me about your your experience in uh, Vietnam. Tell me about it. And he says, well, okay. I'll says, oh, by the way, um, do you guys have that um, finished in there? And, you know, it's almost like, well, like that. But if you're going to go into it, it's got to be, really, are you serious about hearing? Or are you just saying, well, you know, I, tell me about it. It's almost like when somebody comes back from a, a vacation trip and they got all their slides, you know, and you say, well, I'll, let me be careful about asking because they might won't make me sit here and watch all this or they're going to tell me too much more than what I really want to know. So he says, ah, oh, it's okay. Yeah, well, it was this, that, and the other. Nah, yeah, it was kind of tough, but, you know, it was all right. And it is always, there's always going to be the, the thing about, well, did you see anybody get shot? You know, everybody wants that part. You know, you say, no, you didn't get anybody get shot. Well, most oftentimes you're going to say no because, unfortunately, what happens is that that wound that somebody got is not necessarily from a bullet, and it's not necessarily going to be clean. It could be something where they burned and disfigured, or something to where they had gotten blown away because, you know, these Claymore mines, you got something like uh, 800 little pellets in it, and it's going to really mess you up. And so the, the idea of a clean wound that people have is a fantasy. I mean, it's going to be something that's devastating. Now, I'll say this, too, because I'm talking about the wounds. 
I'm sure that at, that, that at one point in time, every, every soldier has thought about this who's had a tour someplace uh, in combat. He's saying, gee, there's that magical wound that's going to get me out of here or going to shorten my turn. You know, I'm going to take a round in the shoulder and it's going to not hit a bone, but it's going to nick me in the muscle. You know, it's going to be something to where, you know, I'm going to go and be with those pretty nurses in Hawaii or something like that. And in your initial tour, when you're there and you're in your first couple of months and all these guys are telling you that their tours, is, uh, they've only got so many days left and you're looking at months you're thinking about this. He says, gee, maybe there's going to be that one little thing that will get me out of here and get me evacuated. But what happens is that you get maimed, you lose your leg, you lose your arm, you lose an eye, you get disfigured. I mean, that's your ticket out. And that's what nobody ever wants. But that quick thought goes across people's mind when, when you're there. And he says, gee, you know, I'll get my Purple Heart, you know, I'll be a hero and that sort of thing. But it never happens clean. It's always ugly. And so when folks will say, do you ever see anybody get shot? Well, if, if they'd say, do you ever see anybody get wounded, and you have to describe it, it's, it's not very pretty. Um, well, anyway, that was a thought that, that came to my mind. Thank you. Anything One else real that, quick? Uh, I'm not sure if I talked about Korea. Did I? Yes, I did talk about uh, the did talk about working with the uh, North Koreans. The North Korea, uh, the, I mean, the with Colonel. the South Koreans up along the North Korean borders. Yes. Uh, that was rewarding too. Good. And um, the stint with the Intelligence Security Command that was totally different. A lot of times, you know, uh, during those periods, officers had what they called. Uh, a secondary specialty. My primary was a, as, as an engineer, engineer, combat engineer, but the second was as a foreign area officer with a specialty in Africa. And in working with National Security Agency under the Intelligence Security Command, I had to know everything there was to know about intelligence in Africa as it was being collected through human intelligence, signals intelligence, or some other form. And because of the security clearance at that time, you had access to a lot of things about um, specifically ground order of battle and, and so forth of, of countries in those areas that, that the normal person wouldn't know. It gives a greater perspective about the U.S. involvement globally than it would otherwise. And it kind of gives me a greater sense as to how in some of our policies now may or may not be failing us. So I just threw that out. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your service to the country. Well, I thank you, and I thank the Cantini uh, organizers and Ball State University, and you three here, too, who seems like a very comfortable team working together. So thanks.